Let's pray together before we begin, shall we? Father, we're coming tonight to consider this most mature of topics, the character of God. And Father, I do thank you. It's by the Holy Spirit that we are able to move and, and speak and have our understanding tonight. And we want to confess immediately our utter dependence upon him. Because, Father, we are trying to understand that which is incomprehensible as far as we are concerned. And, Father, we would ask for the enlightenment of your Holy Spirit to be upon every one of us. That, Father, we might understand the difficult things that we may have to cover during this course. And that, Father, these things should be but the springboard leading us into the deep water. Father, we long in these days, Father, of superficiality to see maturity in the church. And Father, I'm believing, Lord, that this set of tapes is going to start producing some of that maturity. Father, please guide me tonight, Lord, and take my mouth and use it, Father, that it might be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Last time I did a very unbiblical thing, and that is I actually asked the question, does God exist? And for those of you who were here, you'll know why it's so unbiblical. It's unbiblical because the Bible never actually asks the question of whether God exists. The Bible assumes that God exists and, and then goes on to say that any man who says that he doesn't exist is a fool. That's the way, the sort of dismissive attitude that the Bible covers that particular subject. Well, I hope last time that we saw some of the bankruptcy of the atheist ideas that are about in these days. So many of these ideas seem to be so right when you first hear them, but the minute you start looking into them, you see just how exactly wrong they really are. And I hope then that we saw enough evidence to see that whereas there's no absolute proof that God exists, the evidence seems to say that God does exist. I want to repeat one thing I made clear, I hope, last time, that is, and that is, whether you're a believer or an atheist, both of those need faith. It isn't a question that believers have faith and the atheist doesn't have faith. Both actually need faith. And the point I made last time was, if you're an atheist, I believe you need more faith than to be a believer in God. All right, so having established that God is, now we have to go on and ask another question. If God is, then exactly who is he? And later on in this course, we'll be asking another question. Well, if God is, and, and we assume that he is, what's he like? But tonight, one question is enough. God is, yes. Who is he? And the reason that this question is so important is this. If you have a wrong attitude to God, if you have a misunderstanding of who he is, you will actually have a wrong reaction to God. Most Christians today that have a wrong reaction to God somewhere have a wrong idea of who he is. And I find that the two, I, the two things that are most common among Christians today are these two things. One, over-familiarity. That comes from a wrong understanding of who God is. And the second is anxiety, which also comes from a wrong idea of who God is. You know what I mean by over-familiarity, do you? The type of person who talk as if God and him or God and her are just like that. We've been buddies for years, right? And they may say, well, God and I got to know one another about 15 years ago or more likely three months ago, something like that. And every time they speak, they talk about God as if he's their most intimate acquaintance. And not only does he understand them, they understand him. And there's nothing you can tell them about God. They know it all. They've got God taped. Why? It's quite easy. If you live with God like I live with God, this is what it's like. And as they talk, so often what you feel is that they're sort of in partnership with God. You know, it's a, it's a working partnership the two of them together. And then as they continue to talk, you suddenly realize that they are the senior partner <laughs> with, with God sort of following along in their heels, saying, oh, well, if he says it, it must be so. And that's the type of thing that I'm talking about. By the way, of course, there, it is quite right to know God intimately. But you see, that's not over-familiarity, because so often, you know, over-familiarity eventually breeds nothing but contempt. And this is what we have to beware of. And so you've got the over-familiar person. 
The anxious person is the person who also has a wrong idea of God. He thinks that God is a big ogre waiting there with a big stick, and if he puts one foot wrong, God's going to get him. That's the idea. Right, you put a step wrong and I'll knock your block off. That's the idea they have of God. And I'll have to tell you this, that many Christians in mental hospital today are people with that type of idea about God. Do you see what I mean? A wrong idea about God causes you to have a wrong response as far as God is concerned. And this is why we've got to know who he is. But the minute I ask who is God, we run into insurmountable problems and we're going to meet these problems right throughout this course. And that is this, that God is far higher than we are. He is the infinite one, we're the finite one. He is the great one, we're the pipsqueaks who live down here on this earth. And to know who he is or to understand anything about God is almost an impossibility. Let me tell you, God is so immense that our knowledge of him and our understanding of him can only be slight in comparison to the true reality as God really exists. I said earlier that later on in this course we're going to ask the question, what is God like? Well, I'm going to attempt to answer it, but actually there's no answer to it. Because, you see, God is like himself. He's not like anything else. There is no one else like God, nothing like him in the whole universe. So, in fact, if I was being accurate, I'd have to say, what's God like? Well, he's like God. Right? God is God, and that will be the end of the issue. Of course, that doesn't help us, and so I'm going to try and fill out a few details along the way. But we'll understand as we get through that God really is immense. And I would warn any of us living in these days against trying to oversimplify God. Some people have God as a little idol. And the thing about a little idol is, you know, they've got him taped. The little idol is this big and this wide and he lives in that cupboard over there. Or they reduce God down to a a simple person that they understand, you see. and And they think very often that that's who God is. Now, we're going to get into problems and into errors if we start doing that with God. Don't ever try and reduce him down. The whole point of the Bible message is this, that it is the fear of the Lord which is the beginning of wisdom. And this awe of God, it doesn't mean shaking as if a lion's come into the room. It's talking about a healthy awe of God. It's the missing ingredient in Christians' lives today. Last century, they knew what awe was all about. Today, you meet only a handful of people who have any idea of what the awe of God truly is. And I believe a lot of Christians make fundamental errors because they don't have the fear of the Lord in their lives. And look what it says. It doesn't say that the fear of the Lord is wisdom. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You don't have any wisdom if you don't fear the Lord. And you know, sometimes if you listen to a person speak, listen out for the fear of the Lord. Because if the fear of the Lord is, the, is not there, then what they are saying is foolishness through and through. We've got to be aware of this. And normally, it, foolishness like that comes in because it, people reduce God down to a manageable proportion. Can we just turn to Psalm 50. And can we see that this was one of the mistakes that the Jews made? Psalm 50 is a psalm of judgment. And in this particular psalm, God is actually declaring that he will judge the Jews. Psalm 50. Can I just read the first few verses? Psalm 50. Beginning verse 1. And God declares that he's going to rise and he's going to judge. Definitely. It says, The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the the earth that that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God is judge himself, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. And so he's moving in in judgment. And you might say, well, what was the mistake 
that Israel made. He's going to tell them off about their religion. He's going to tell them off about their false sacrifices. He's going to tell them off about their sin. But in one verse, he describes the real problem that caused them to sin in the first place. And as I read this verse out, you ask yourself whether this isn't true of the generation in which we live. In verse 21, look what it says. These things hast thou done and kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. See that little phrase? You thought that I was altogether like you. And that's where your mistake has come. And today, people think that God is altogether like them. Now, may I say, you are created in the image of God. That does not mean to say that you are altogether like God. You know what these people were saying? These people were saying, well, you know, I, um, this is what I do, and God, if God wants a relationship with me, he's got to put up with it. I've got to put up with it in other people, God better put up with it in me. And do you see what they've done? They've reduced God down to their own little level, making him like them. And sometimes you see this happening in the body of Christ today, that we've got God absolutely sewn up, and we think that because he's just like us, we can talk to him as we please. And sometimes you hear Christians, I hear it in private conversations, I hear it in ministry sometimes. People who talk to God as if he's their younger brother, there to be kicked about, you know, to be told off, um, to be shoved here and shoved there, and you demand an explanation of him here. And what they've done is this. They are acting as if God is just an ordinary person. Just an ordinary one. Oh, that's it. Well, God, frankly, I'm disappointed. That's what they say. To God. You see, the, be- the fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. You don't find this type of attitude among great Christians, nor among the great people in the Old Testament. You don't. Always those that feared the Lord were very careful how they spoke to God. Have you ever noticed that? They really feared the Lord in their hearts. And those who feared the Lord saw greater revelations of God. There was no attempt to make God just like them. You know, they knew that God was God, and that's who he is. And so these people come, and they receive tremendous revelations of the Lord. And you know, when they received a knowledge of the holy, so amazing things happened to them. And they had trouble describing God. The minute they saw him as they were, they couldn't be as certain as some people are today, what God is saying and what God is doing. And immediately you find these people who've truly seen God, they find that they run out of words. They can't describe what they're seeing. Let's, before we uh, have a look at how people have reduced God down to their own level, can we see just two passages where people saw God and see the reaction? Uh, in Daniel, first of all, in chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10, here is Daniel and he sees a vision of God. And because it's God that he sees, he can't describe it. You'll find in these passages, you, get, you find them in Ezekiel and in <clears throat> other writers, they all the time use words like as, like, have the, the appearance of. And what they're really saying is, look, I can't explain this. This is the best I can do, folks. That's what he's actually saying. And he sees a man whose loins were girded with fine gold of Aphaz. This is Daniel 10, and I'm going to begin verse 6. Now look at this. His body also was like the beryl. That's the precious stone barrel, I should add. And his face as the appearance of lightning. What he's saying is it wasn't lightning, but how can I describe it to you? That's the nearest I can get. It's not like anything, really, but that's the nearest. And his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. The voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. The appearance of God. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and, uh, and my face towards the ground. 
And you see what happens? All he does, he sees this vision, he hears the voice, and he falls like a dead thing to the floor. See the effect upon knowing God. There's no over-familiarity. Oh, God's just appeared to me. And I should tell you what he said to me. God! There's no attempt to... And you'll notice in Daniel 10, he doesn't really say what was said to him. He's so overcome, he forgets to write it down. And that was God, of course, telling him not to. But he saw fantastic things. And then over in uh, Revelation, right, we'll see similar. In Revelation and chapter 1. In Revelation 1, right, verse 14 onwards, I'll just read it very quickly. His head and his hairs, this is Revelation 1, verse 14, were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And God has to raise him. Now, can you see the effect of knowing God upon these people? Suddenly, the flesh became dead. And I think that is a hallmark of someone who really knows God, that the flesh gradually begins quietening down and actually peters out eventually. That's what I think it is. It's not the opposite. That is the flesh getting more and more uh, grotesque and, and bloated. It's not the case. To know God is actually the great secret of everything. <laughs> Now, you'll notice these men, there were no complaints coming out of their, mind, their mouth. Daniel never says, well, God, you've let me down. You took me into captivity. Right? Why, God, have you taken me into captivity? He never says it. He absolutely accepts it. Because God is God, you see. And the fear of the Lord comes in, and there it is. He holds it. Do you remember the three children? These teenagers who knew something about God. And do you remember Nebuchadnezzar says, I'll throw you into the ferny... The, the burning, fiery furnace. I will. What do they say? No, you won't. God won't permit it. And then when they're thrown in, they stand in the middle and say, God, why have you done this to me? I stood firm for your testimony, and you've allowed me to be chucked into the fiery furnace. No, sir, you don't hear it. What do you hear? The words of truth coming out of their mouths. They say to Nebuchadnezzar, well, if God saves us from the fiery furnace, so be it. But if he doesn't, so be it. And they say, we don't care. Well, one thing we know is we're not going to bow down and worship that statue. And do you see, these people have a fear that is missing in the church today. For today, and please don't feel condemned, anyone here, we've all done it at times and we've got to stop it. Today, people talk to God literally as if God's a hempecked husband. They talk to God as if they're a sort of inefficient wife. They talk to God as if he's a servant and a servant who's not very good and they demand an account of him. God, what exactly do you think you're doing in my life? That's what they say. Or God, this is what you've done to me and I am tell you I don't like it. And they talk to God. What's their error? Psalm 50 says exactly what their error is. They have made God altogether like themselves. And it's utter foolishness coming out of their mouths. And in their own lives, they will reap the results of that foolishness. I'll have to tell you this, I hear ministers saying, you, you ought to do this. This is how you ought to speak to God, apparently. You know, They call it, and I have to speak out, because I tell you, whenever I hear it, I feel offence in my spirit. I can't bear it, and I can't stand it. My wife came home from a certain meeting, somewhere or other, and I said, a good meeting, darling? Yes, she said, I, I think so. And then I, I thought, well, I must ask her a bit more. And I said, what do you mean you think so? And she said, well, someone said something. And she said, I'm sure most people didn't notice. And then she told me what they'd said. And she said, and do you know, I was offended on God's behalf that they should talk to God in that manner. And yet it was done in the name of being honest, you see. And, the, and very often you'll hear people say it. If you hate God, tell him you hate him. Right? If you're out with him, tell him you're out with him. If you can't stand him, tell him you can't stand him. What's their error? They've made God just an ordinary person and a bit minor. You know, as if he's an ordinary brother or an ordinary sister. It is utter foolishness. And ask yourself, where is the fear of the Lord in all that? The fear of the Lord is nowhere in it, and it is foolishness as far as God is concerned. If you want a scripture for that, 
Do you remember Job? Remember Job? And Job had lost everything. Didn't he have a right to turn on God and say, God, what are you doing? Didn't he have a right to do it? He lost everything. He lost his children. He lost all of his goods. And finally he had boils all over his body and he sits there and he scrapes himself with bits of broken pot, you know, scraping himself all the way down. And his wife comes up and says, curse God, go on, curse him. You must feel out with God that he's done all this to you. Curse him, go on. And do you remember what the Bible says that Job said to his wife? And do you remember what the Bible commentary on Job is? Oh, if we would learn this lesson, we would really get somewhere as far as God is concerned. Let's go to Job in chapter 2 and we'll see it. Right, right, Job chapter 2. I love verse 8. Here it is. This would test most Christians today, but we've got to get to the place where we would answer like Job answered. That's got to be the desire in our heart. And verse 8... Job 2, verse 8, and he took himself a potsherd to scrape himself with all, that means all over, and he sat down among the ashes. And here she comes, verse 9, right? Here it is, modern psychology coming out. And it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Are you still going to be pious and in awe of God with all this going on? Come on, she says, curse God and then die. And Job's reaction, I'll tell you, it's my reaction as well. I loathe it when I hear people speaking to God as if if he's their inferior brother and they're demanding an account of what he's doing. Look at Job's reply. And this is uprightness in the heart of a man. Look what it says. He said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speak. That's what he says. Foolish talk coming out of your mouth. And then he says, what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? He says, isn't God God? Isn't God permitted to give to us what he pleases? Can't God do with us as he pleases? Or as it's put in other parts of the Old Testament, has the clay any right to rail against the potter? It would be ridiculous as if the clay would say to the potter, well, I didn't want to be, you know, this vase. Right? I didn't want to be. I wanted to be a Dresden... China doll. That's what I wanted to be. And quite honestly, I think you've gone beyond the pale at this point. I mean, if you were a potter, what would you do? You'd say, all right, and you'd smash it up and you'd start again. You'd make him something worse. That's what you'd do. That's what I would do. But do you see, that's what Job is saying. Look, can't God be God? Isn't he permitted to be God? And until we see the restoration of the fear of the Lord like this in our hearts, I'll tell you this, our Christianity is going to be surface. It's going to be materialistic and self-centered all the time. We've got to come to a new place in God and see those people who are speaking like the foolish women, right? Shall we receive good from the hand of God only? And then when a little bit of evil comes along, we demand to know what God's doing and how dare he? Who does he think he is kicking me around like this? That's the wrong attitude that's got to be stopped. And it's only when you see God as he really is, that God is God, that this will be solved in our hearts. Ecclesiastes says the same. Let's quickly go to Ecclesiastes. And this whole book is written by a man out of fellowship. And here is truth written in the middle of this particular book. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'm sorry to be so uncompromising about this, but I find a lot of nonsense spoken in these present days. And as I said last week, much of our Christianity today is man-orientated. It's not God-orientated. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2, there's a lot of truth. In verse 1, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. And in the temple that it's being talked about here, the word of God was taught. But these people weren't interested in the word of God. Let's get the sacrifice over with and be on our way. And they were giving the sacrifice of fools, not realizing that they had offended the righteous God. And then the next verse. Be not rash with thy mouth. Lord, help us, please. Be not rash 
with our mouth. And let not, not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. And it means chosen words here. Before you go and open your mouth and tell God what you think of him, you just stop for a minute and remember, God happens to be up in heaven and you're down here in the earth. Please, can we see the fear of the Lord coming into our conversation just a little more? That's what he's saying. Do you know, in the ancient days, a king, if he didn't like you, had the uh, right to chop off your head, to put you to death in the most awful manner. Can you imagine going up to a king like that and saying, excuse me, but I'm out with you, right? And there you are in your tatters, you're from the streets, you go up to his golden chariot, you're all big-headed. Now listen, I'm out with you, king, you just splattered my tunic with your mud as your wheels went past. Would you say that? No, you wouldn't. Why not? You'd have your head cut off. That's why. And there's enough fear in the human level for us not to speak to God like, to kings like that. Is God any less than these kings? Of course not. God is more than these kings. And so what this is saying, don't you utter, open your mouth and utter foolishness. You think about it very hard and remember that God is in his heaven. And we've got to see that this is the case. Have you noticed a lot of people today talk about their visions and all the things that they've seen? I used to get a lot of magazines, you know. I've cancelled my subscription to most of them because I got sick of certain things that were said in them. So often you'd have a man and he said, oh, I had a vision uh, a year ago and I was taken up into heaven. And do you know what I saw? I saw God over there and this over here and I saw this and I saw that. And then God said to me, hey, he said, Roger. Uh, and there's a conversation that goes on. You're my appointed man and everything. And down he comes, he travels all over Britain telling of this wonderful vision. And every time I read these stories, I had a little check in my heart. And I thought, Lord, I'd love to see someone in the Bible talking in that frame of mind. And always there's one passage I go to. And do you know, it's so different from what we see today and what is generally called spirituality that I just know much of what we have in our days the days in which we live is false spirituality. Can we just go to this passage? And I think it demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about. In 2 Corinthians, and chapter 12, and do you know this is a difficult passage? And there are people who don't understand it. Have you ever read this and wondered what on earth Paul is talking about in this particular thing? I'll just read uh, a few verses through. And remember that there were many people coming to, into the Corinthian church and into the Galatian church boasting of the visions that they'd have. Puffed up, as Paul says in certain of his books. Puffed up with their visions. There they are, full of visions. I've seen this, I've seen this, God said this, and so it goes on. Right? And, and he then gives his version of what he's seen. And he'd seen more than a lot of them. And look at the difference in attitude that is here. He says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Here's his testimony of the visions and revelations he'd had. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And I'm going to end there. By the way, those who claim uh, a thorn in the flesh, you're claiming a pretty high thing. You're claiming that something, God had had to give you something to stop you being so exalted because of all the revelations you've received. That's what you're actually claiming if you say you have a thorn in the flesh. But who's Paul talking about here? I'll tell you who he's talking about. He's talking about himself. This man, Paul, had been taken up into heaven. 
He had seen paradise. He'd seen things the like of which he'd never seen before. He had heard words which he said are unutterable. They're unspeakable. And every time he remembered it, humility came into his heart. So much so that he won't identify himself with this man. He speaks about himself in the third person singular. This man, he, this is what he saw. I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. But it was fan so fantastic. And do you see the effect of a real revelation on this man's heart? I long for the genuine article today. I really do. I long for it in our days. And notice he gives no details of what he saw at all. We, I would have written a book telling everyone all the details of everything I'd seen. He doesn't. The awe of God is in this passage. And he reacts the way Isaiah reacted. I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. What does he say? Woe unto me. I am undone, he says. He doesn't say, oh great. And off he goes to tell everyone what he'd seen. Woe unto me, he says, because he'd seen God as he really was. High and lifted up. God Almighty himself. And beloved, I want to say this that we've got to see the fear coming back into Christianity in these days. Now, it's lovely to say that the Lord told you something, but I generally find that people who have heard the word of the Lord, there's an awe in their voice, isn't there? They say, oh, the Lord's revealed something to me. And all the time, God is glorified. The trouble is with so many people who claim visions today, you know God is cheapened a little, and they are glorified. This great man of God who's seen all these wonderful things and they strut, uh, strut forward, you know. It's the opposite with Paul. They may claim all these wonderful things, but Paul says, I won't glory in that. I will rather glory in my infirmities. Because when you see the glory of God, you suddenly realize just how weak and feeble you are. What about Moses? Do you remember Moses asked to see the glory of God? And God said, all right, he said but climb in that cleft in the rock, I'll put my hand over you, and when I'm a long way in the distance, having gone, then you might look out. And Moses, and it's said of Moses that he spoke to God face to face. Moses could only see God disappearing in the distance. It's a different thing, isn't it, from what we hear today? Entirely different. We've got in our own lives to get the awe of the Lord back. And I believe this, that as we seek God, he'll give us the awe that we long for. I heard a story some years ago, I don't know whether it's true, but I somehow believe it, of, of a person who was always talking about their revelations of the Lord. And one day they had a revelation of the Lord and they never opened their mouth again. And I tend to find that that rings true in my own life, you know, that the deeper I go with God, the less I seem to share of what God has truly revealed. The day will come, undoubtedly. Now we, of course, have a close relationship with the Lord. We have a brotherly relationship with him. The Holy Spirit has made him closer than our breath. But let us beware, lest we take that grace in vain, lest we become over-familiar with God, and it turns to contempt so that we treat him just as if he's an ordinary person. And let us beware in our own hearts, you know, lest we, we find that we are cheapening God in the way we speak about him and to him. God must be God. That's the essential thing. So who is God? God's God. That's the first thing I've got to say. And let's remember it. But now I want to just talk about one or two other things as far as God is concerned. And we've got to get these absolutely clear. Uh, before I do, can I just say this? I'm not in any way suggesting that we start making God distant as far as we're concerned. The Holy Spirit has made him close to us, right? The Jews, you know, in the Old Testament made him so distant they wouldn't even pronounce his name. And at first that was wonderful because they wanted to awe God, but it ended up with God being just absolutely out of their understanding and the sphere of their being. We mustn't do that. We've got to find the balance in all of this. Do you see? So that the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, is the thing that typifies our life. All right, so there's the first thing. God is God, and let's remember it. The next thing I want to say is this. God is a person, right? God is a person. He's not a force field like Einstein thought he was. Einstein said, God is, oh, God exists, he said. He's just a force out in the universe, right? He's not. He's a real person. And I'm so glad he's a person. What marks out a person? Personality, obviously. God has a personality. God has feeling. God has emotion. 
God has thoughts. God has memory. Isn't that wonderful? So that God can react to us. Do you know that God acts? God speaks. God reacts with us. This is the essence of prayer, you know. It's a wonderful thing. You go to God and you say, God, I'm in need. And God, because he's a person, responds to you in that need. It's the most glorious truth. God is a person. And we are made in the image of God. That is, we've got personality. We've got thought, most of us, that is, anyway. We've got emotion, right? We've got memory. We've got reaction. This is why we can link up with God and we can really be in touch with him. It's wonderful what God has done. Every person on this earth, actually, because they have something of the image of God within them, they need God to be there. Every one of them does. Do you know that when Billy Graham says that inside every man there's a God-shaped void, that's absolutely true. All of us need a God who loves us and who responds to us. And if you say God doesn't exist, all you're left with is the creation, the universe. And you know, it doesn't help to say, well, the universe loves me. I mean, it's so impersonal. Or going up to a tree and saying, I'm in real need, can you help me? And the tree is just there, you know, an object. No, no, all people need a God of response. And do you know what they've done? They reject God and they've put a God into creation. Have you ever heard the phrase used, Mother Earth? That is an apostate saying, you, you should never use it. And what they're saying is this, Mother Earth has brought forth these things. The implication underneath is, of course, Mother Earth has a beating heart, you know. She cares for her children. There they come. When you die, Mother Earth takes you into her bosom again, dust to dust. You see? Or if they don't say Mother Earth, what do they say? Mother Nature. That's another one. And have you noticed they personalize nature? You see, you hear it on the radio. Well, then uh, nature decided that the fish ought to come onto the land. So nature developed lungs in these fish. Nature did it. Now, the, what they're suggesting is that nature has a thought, you know, has reaction. Nature can do something. They're personifying the creation. It's all rubbish. And it comes because they deny God, and yet they need this beating heart of a saviour. That's what it's all about. Never use the phrase. It's rubbish. Nature did nothing. God did something through nature. That's the truth. And that's why I always write nature with a small N and never with a capital N. The only things that get capitals in my life are God, Jesus Christ, He when it refers to God and things like that. Nature never gets one. Neither does Mother Earth, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you see? So we've got to make sure that we are right in our thinking. God really is a person. And that's why in the Bible you never have the pronoun it used of God. It never says, and then it came down and spoke. You know, and it is an inanimate object. And it is a tree. And it is the universe. But God in the Bible is always he. Isn't that lovely? And the minute you say he, you've got a beating heart in there. God's a real person. Marvellous. All right? That's why the title Father is used. Father, and the minute you say Father of God, right, not Father Russia or Father this, but Father God, you've got a beating heart. Friend is used of God. See what that entails. Capital F now. Friend. Counselor. He'll answer your questions. He'll respond. He'll try and help you. That's who God is. He's a real person. Shepherd tends his flock. All these things show us this. God is a person. That's, that's who he is. Right. So there you've got, got that. The third point I want to make is this. God is a spirit. And we've got to get this absolutely clear. God is a spirit. Numbers 23, in, don't turn to it, but in the prophecy that Balaam gave, he makes this little statement. He says, God is not a man. He's not a man. And that's why we must never, ever, ever reduce God down to a simple human level. Jesus is the one we turn to to find teaching on this. So let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And verse 24, and then we'll turn to Luke and we'll understand what Jesus is saying. John 4, verse 24, it says, God is a spirit here. 
God is a spirit, and that's true. God is not a man. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the, the implication of what he's saying here can only be understood if you now compare that with the words of Jesus after he was risen from the dead. And if you go to Luke 24, where Jesus appears, he stands in the midst, and do you remember the disciples are all frightened? In verse uh, 37, this is why they're frightened. Luke 24, verse 37. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they'd seen a spirit. Now Jesus has to prove to them that he's not a spirit. God is a spirit, but he has to prove he's not a spirit. So what's he do? He said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And a spirit does not have a body, and God is a spirit. Ah, I haven't said that immediately. Certain of you are going to say, ah, oh, hold on a minute. The Bible says that God has a body, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't it say that underneath are the everlasting arms, meaning the arms of God? Doesn't it say that the mouth of the Lord has spoken it? Doesn't it? Doesn't it say that the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save? Doesn't it say that his eyes run to and fro in the earth? Doesn't it say all that? Yes, it does. But that doesn't make God a man. These are what we call, and I've written it up, an anthropomorphism. And I'm going to spell it. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-M-O-R-P-H-I-S-M. And an anthropomorphism means that we give to God the characteristics of man that we might understand something about him. It doesn't really mean that he's got a literal hand like we've got. It helps us identify something of God. For example, if I said, well, God reaches down with his urlot, or some other word like that, and you say, well, what's an urlot? Well, only God's got one. And I can't tell you what it is because I've never seen him. And we'd be stuck and you'd say, well, he's got urlots. And what's that? You see, an insect has antenna. We don't have antenna, but at least you can pick an insect up and say, that is an antenna. But if God's got an urlot, I don't know whether he has or not. Don't take it as a word of prophecy. But uh, if God's got an urlot, I'd never be able to show you what an urlot was he lifts you up with his urlot. <laughs> you think, what's that? So it's easier for us to understand God by saying he lifts us up in his arms, in his hands. We understand. But don't push it. Just because the Bible uses these phrases, it does not make God a man. It doesn't. In case you're not convinced, let me just show you a little psalm where if you try and make God a man here, I don't know what you end up with in this psalm. Let's go to Psalm 91. Verse 4. You all know this very well, I hope. Psalm 91, verse 4. Now look what it says. Psalm 91, verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. Now, you see, if you push it, you make God into a bird here. <laughs> And you see the point that I'm making? Now, what does it mean? Does it mean God's got feathers and wings? No, it doesn't. It's a picture of what a bird does to its young. It's what Jesus meant when he said, how I could have gathered you, you know, like a chick is gathered in by the mother. Oh, I long to do it. And we've all seen birds as they fluff up their feathers and they protect their youngsters. And so it's saying, listen, God will protect you like that. But it doesn't make God a bird. And God isn't a man either, and so you must remember that. God is a spirit, and because he's a spirit, he doesn't have a body, right? Let's see a few scriptures on that and just locate it. In 1 Timothy, and we want three scriptures here, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, by the way, this is mysterious. We're beginning to reach the mysterious parts of our God. I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who thought that in 14 short hours 
I would be able to encapsulate God, capture him. And this is God in 14 hours. No, no, no. At the end of 14 hours, you'll have more mysteries than you ever knew existed. In 1 Timothy 1.17, look what he says about God. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible. See that? He's invisible. God is, because he's a spirit, see? The only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And in 1 Timothy 6, we'll just read these very quickly. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15, speaking not of Jesus, speaking of God himself, Verse 15, talking about until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he, Jesus, shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. That's God. Whom no man hath seen nor can see. That's God. To whom be honor and power everlasting. So God's invisible. But having said that, God at times does reveal himself. That is within his power to do it, and he does it. In the Old Testament, do you remember he revealed himself in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? Do you remember that? That was an appearance of God. But was God like those? Not really. He just appeared like that. And the Shekinah glory used to come down. Do you remember? In the temple over the, te the Ark of the Covenant and so on. And that was a sort of cloud and they said the presence of God has come down. That's how he appeared. It's a mystery. The invisible God able to appear in front of people in a certain form. And now read 1 Timothy and chapter 3 verse 16. And I'm so glad that uh, verse 16 begins with Paul saying this is a mystery indeed. Look what it says, and here it's talking about Jesus. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And who is big enough to understand this? This is a whole series of paradox. God is invisible, yet Jesus is his exact image. It's a complete paradox, you see. And God was revealed in the flesh, even though he is a spirit. All right, two more verses, I think, on this. In Colossians 1, 15, I pointed this out many times. Now you'll understand why I have to keep pointing it out. In verse 15, and it says here of Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. Do you see that? A God who is invisible has no image, but Jesus is his image. It's a complete mystery. And the last verse on this section, verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in Jesus Christ himself. And I think you begin to see that God in his totality is incomprehensible as far as we are concerned. So that's the next point. God is a spirit. Two more points. The next one, and this is the hardest of all as far as we are concerned, God is the creator, not part of the creation. God is the creator. And at this point, we find it so hard. You see, all of us in this room are created beings. We live in a created world. Everything around us has been created. Everything we come into contact with has been created. And so we can't understand anything that is above the creation. God is the creator, and the creator created all that was created. But he's not part of the creation. He's separate to it. And so we have to think in new terms as far as God is concerned. Remember last week I actually said, where did matter come from? Where did the universe come from? Remember that in the last Bible study? You see, we know that matter and the universe has been created. And as such, it must have come from somewhere. Because it's part of creation. But listen. The minute you then hear someone say, oh, but where did God come from? Or a little child saying, Daddy, where did God come from? It's a totally erroneous question. You can't ask it. What they are doing, they're making God part of the creation. Well, he's not part of the creation. The minute you say, where did someone come from? You're saying they had an origin. Well, God, let me tell you, didn't have an origin. 
We've read it, haven't we, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Unto the king eternal. Eternal means he never had a beginning. How can we understand that? No wonder a child has difficulty with it. We have difficulty with it. But you see, God is not part of the creation. And if you say he has an origin and are simplistic about it, you make him part of the creation. But he's not. I get letters sometimes. Dear Roger, um, your Bible studies have made the things of the Bible so clear. Never understood them before. I just have two questions. And just a little note will help me. One, who is God? And two, where did he come from? (laughs) Just a little note, you know. and, And they'd love me to say, well, God came from this. But listen, if God came from anywhere, he's a created being. And if he's a created being, he's not God, because God must be eternal. Oh, it's a hard thing for us. You see, God is in a category we've never met before. Everything we've met before had a beginning. But God doesn't have a beginning by definition. Let me tell you, if I could encapsulate God in five minutes or on one sheet of paper and said, this is God, he wouldn't be worth knowing. He'd be so minor, so mediocre, he really wouldn't be worth knowing. I'm afraid to tell you that if you ask the question, where did God come from, it's an erroneous question. He didn't come from anywhere. He's always been. You see? right? God is eternal, the eternal one. The nearest I can get to this in a form that we can understand is this. Have you ever been into a history room and you've seen a wall chart, a frieze as we call it, showing time periods? Right? Going along the wall. And here's the Romans, right? Here's the Saxons, there are the Normans and the Plantagenets, and so you go along. Now, it's as if we live on this frieze, right? And I occupy this bit of space between here and here. Now, everyone on that frieze is stuck on the frieze. We can only think in terms of the frieze. And God comes and he intervenes here, here and here. And we tend to think the God's on the frieze as well. And so we say, ah, well, God was here and God was there. Where did God begin? The truth is, God isn't on the frieze. God's standing in the history room looking at the frieze. And do you see, he can see the whole of time in one moment. He can see the beginning and the end in one moment. He can come and he can intervene here and intervene here at the same time. That's God. It doesn't help, but... (laughs) But you see the incomprehensibility of this thing. You see? So there it is. God is creator. And may we remember when we speak to him, we're not talking to another created being. We're talking to the one who is above the whole of creation. And the very last point I want to make is this. Right? God is one. We are one of the three major monotheistic religions. Christianity, Mohammedanism and Judaism are the three religions that have one God. And I must correct your thinking if you think we've got three gods. We don't. We have one God and one God only. Okay? Deuteronomy 6, of course, says it very clearly. The passage that all Jews recite. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. We are a monotheistic Uh, faith. And Jesus himself didn't deny it. Now Jesus is God, as we're going to see next time. But he still says there's one God. Let's just go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and here's Jesus himself affirming the truth of this. Mark 12, verse 29 And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And Jesus is affirming his faith that there is only one God. And the last scripture for tonight is where we find Paul also affirming there is only one God. And let's find that again in Timothy. 1 Timothy And chapter 2, verse 5, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, going to read verse 3, 4, and 5. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There is one God and one God only. And you see why I have to end the Bible study at this point? 
Because here we come to the whole mystery of what we call the Trinity. Right? That we believe God, the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, yet we have only one God. And beginning next week, I'm going to digress before we get on to the whole question of what God is like. And we're going to have a good look at the Trinity. And we'll see why our God has to be a Trinity. All right? One in essence, but three in personality. And we'll understand why it's important and why the Bible constantly affirms it. Let me tell you this. If Jesus is not God, none of you are saved at all. And we'll see this mystery beginning to unfold before our eyes and we'll pray God to give us an understanding in all of these things. Let's just pray together, shall we? <coughs> Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, the things that we've uh, discussed tonight are very mature things. And we do thank you, Lord, that we are leaving the milk stage now and coming on to the mature things of God. Father, tonight I don't want anyone condemned by anything that I've said. But Father, rather challenged, as I'm challenged myself, that we've got to start looking to you as God, as who you really are. Father, I pray, Lord, that there should be a new awe and fear in our relationship with you. Father, as we gather together to pray and to praise, that, Father, we should be free, oh yes, amen, but our hearts should indeed realize we are praising the Great One, the One who is Creator, the One who is above all, and that, Father, our praise should therefore come into purity before you. And that, Father, as we see your magnificence and your greatness, your omnipotence, Father, we should find ourselves worshipping at your feet and then find that you reach down your hand and you start doing mighty things in the midst of us. Father, bring us into maturity, please. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen.